like a trusted turnout jacket you've had for years, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric delivers a perfectly broken-in feel on the very first wear. Flexible, comfortable, and powered with the strength of Enforced technology, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric is made to move. To learn more, visit TenkataFabrics.com slash Flex 7. Flex 7, powered by Enforced technology. Only from Tenkata Protective Fabrics. Seconds count when responding to an emergency. Minutes save count when documenting your day. Emergency networking makes records management easier and faster with its Fire and EMS solution. User-friendly, complete online and offline functionality, highly customizable, all at an affordable price. For more information, please visit emergencynetworking.com. All right, everybody. Uh, Anthony Castro is here with uh, another edition of the Command Show, and this is a particularly special edition for many reasons. Number one, um, we're going to honor and commemorate uh, the brothers that passed on nine eleven. Not only that day, but since. Um, and to do that, we have a very, very special guest, um, Chief John Norman from FDNY. Uh, you know who he is. I don't need to make any introductions, but um, I'm just thankful that he agreed to talk with us today about an event that was so sacred uh, to him, um, affected him personally on multiple levels. Um, obviously, he lost hundreds of brothers that day, um, very dear friends, um, uh, family, family. And also uh, was thrust into a position of, of command on a level that I don't think he was expecting um, in the in the weeks that followed. So uh, this is going to be a very important, special edition of the Command Show. And I just wanted to start by thanking Chief John Norman for being with us today. Hello, Anthony. Thanks for having me and for doing this tribute. Yeah, that's what this is, Chief. Thank you very much. It is a tribute. Um, for those of you who haven't um, bought the book. Uh, Chief wrote a book called Working with Giants, and he talked a lot about 9-11 in that book. Um, and, um, but he has had such a storied career at the FDNY and before, uh, and his impact has reached international uh, proportions. And um, I found that book to be incredibly cathartic. Uh, I, I responded to New York on 9-11 with our Urban Search and Rescue Team Task Force 7 from Sacramento. We deployed on the 11th. And one of the big things that sticks out now, 22 years later, was the, the loss of our mutual friend, Dennis Mojica. And, and Dennis um, was somebody I met at the National Fire Academy. And he was, he was just somebody I instantly bonded with. Uh, I adored that man for the short time we knew each other. Uh, he, I still have the T-shirt he gave me from Rescue One. Uh, I still have his business card. Uh, and most importantly, I still have the impression he left on me. Um, the memory, sir. That's right. Yeah. And so one of the most uh, profound things from Chief's book, Working with Giants, was where he talked about Dennis. I had no idea that, that he and Dennis were that close. Oh, and I always wondered, I always wondered what, what Dennis went through that morning, um, what, what, who are he was working, et cetera, et cetera. And Chief's book, which I can only imagine was very difficult to write, was very cathartic for me to read. And I thank him for that. So we're going to talk about um, all kinds of things this morning. We're just going to free flow, see where it goes. But uh, I thought maybe starting with talking about uh, our mutual friend and and the kind of person he was. But when we talk about never forget that this is what it is. It's not just a sticker. It's not a tattoo. Mm -hmm. It's not going to some event on nine eleven. It's it's this. It's remembering those special moments with our brothers that we had that made them special that keep them alive in our hearts. So with that, Chief. Uh, Thank you again for being with us. And uh, Dennis Mojica, what a what a character he was. And uh, is, he's still in my heart, and I know he, I can only imagine how he, how he, what he means to you. Yeah, every day I think of Dennis and so many other, all others. I mean, so many fantastic people lost that day. Uh, you know, I just – I do an Instagram post and uh, just – this past week, uh, Stanley Ryback, who was a lieutenant in the hazmat operations, uh, said, you know, it's a very stressful time of year for many of us. And my reply was, yeah, you know, it is very stressful, but I choose to focus on the good times. Remember all the great times we had with these folks, not just to focus on the loss, 
but you know we're privileged to have a you know such a wonderful career with work working with such wonderful people and that's what i choose to you know keep in the forefront uh, their memory on a positive note so yeah, dennis dennis and i shared a couple of uh, attributes if you will uh, we both started in the same firehouse, although he was years ahead of me. He had left uh, before I got there. Uh, but that common lineage, if you will, your roots uh, in the fire department in the city of New York, that, that goes a long way. Uh, when you can say, yeah, I work there, and then you reach back and you talk to some of the people that you both knew and they kind of vet you. Uh, that helped a lot. Uh, I met Dennis. I was a new lieutenant in Rescue Company too, and Dennis uh, was one of the senior firefighters there. He was actually one of the chauffeurs. And uh, when he started driving me, uh, we were filling each other out. You know, here's a 20-year firefighter, and I'm a at that time a nine-year uh, you know member. I'm a lieutenant, so I'm the boss, and he's the senior experienced guy. So he's feeling me out. And I was very lucky. We were doing a lot of fire duty then. It was December of 89. And uh, we went to a series of mill fires, knitting mills, that turned out it was a, an arson chain. But that first night, I'll never forget, you know, he was. We've been to fires before, but most of them were apartment fires and, you know, it wasn't the real severe threat to your life that, you know, going to a knitting mill, a large mill kind of fire could be. So he, on the way up, uh, going up Lewis Avenue, he says, so Lou, you know, like, what do you want me to do? And being the chauffeur, the senior man, uh, he gets a lot of leeway in what he wants to do. You give him... He's like the second in command. So you kind of uh, say, okay, Dennis, uh, you know, well, let's see what the chief has to say when we get in. And uh, we got into a pretty hairy position there. And uh, it, it turned out fine, but that, you know, bonded us tightly. And then the next night, the very next night, we go to, two or three more of those knitting mills, including one where Dennis was in bad shape. I mean, a collapse narrowly missed him, but then it cut off his retreat. And uh, that was a, a real hairy period there. But when we came out of that together, like we were, we were very, very tight uh, to the point where we'd see each other off duty uh, you know, we go to dinner together, uh, our wives and well, my wife and uh, his fiance at the time. And uh, it, then Dennis got promoted shortly thereafter. And a couple of months, maybe a year after he got promoted, he calls me back for advice. Uh, he had been called by the fire commissioner's office and the commissioner told him he wanted to assign him to rescue company one as a lieutenant. And he was a little bit nervous about it. He didn't want to be seen as being uh, somebody who's getting something he wasn't in line for. And I said, Dennis, you're crazy. That is absolutely, you are one of the most qualified people in the department. You belong there. And uh, I was still a lieutenant in two. And he was going to be a lieutenant in one, and it was great. You know, he's a tremendous, tremendous guy, extremely talented, very, very knowledgeable. And uh, he did. He took the assignment. And then about th two more years after that, I got promoted to captain, and then I got assigned to Rescue Company 1 also. So we were uh, 24 partners. He would relieve me or I would relieve him each shift. So we saw each other a lot again. Again, continued to go to dinner together. In fact, our last dinner was in, uh, I'd say, uh, maybe August, mid-August of 2001. And he announced that he and Maria, his fiance, were going to get married. 
November 11th, I believe it was now. And he asked if I would come and if we could bring the apparatus. Uh, it was going to be held, the ceremony was going to be held in Brooklyn. So I said, well, I don't know if I can get Rescue One there because we cover Manhattan, but we could certainly make sure that uh, we get either Rescue One or Rescue Two there. And then, uh, you know, three weeks later, he was dead. So it was, a, it's a very bitter memory, but uh, you know, I think of the great times before that. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, reading that in uh, working with giants was um, was uh, a privilege. And so, anybody who's watching, I, I would highly, highly encourage you to get Chief's book, Working with Giants, because he goes a little more in depth to what that looked like, what that felt like. Again, for me, it was cathartic because I, um, having been there that week, you know, we had through FDIC West and the, the national USAR family, if you will, through FEMA, we had met a lot of FDNY brothers. And Dennis was one of the ones who stood out. Um, and uh, Bobby Athanas was another one for me. And I remember um, when I saw the, the task force tent in the melee at ground zero for your task force, I, I peeked in the tent just to see who I might know. And uh, there was, there was, um, Bobby Fannis and I and I thought I saw a ghost. I went, oh my God, he's alive! And so hallelujah! And I hugged him, and, I, and then he, as we're hugged, embracing, he whispers in my ear that Dennis didn't make it. And so it was like, gosh, dang it! It was uh, a, a roller coasters of up, ups and downs, you know. Um, so I can only, I can't even imagine what uh, it was like for you. And, and you were at the time of 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 nine eleven. Uh, not only were you not in charge of all of special operations you were you were off duty that day and had to kind duty, of make your way in and i wasn't assigned to sock at all i was a, a battalion chief up in harlem and uh, fortunately like you say i was not only off duty i was sleeping still i was sleeping in because it was my first day of vacation so i didn't know anything about the attack until almost 10 o'clock in the morning uh, when i got a call from Battalion Chief Tom Roby, who was on duty in the 16th Battalion. And the recall had been announced. So he was now tasked with calling all the assigned officers, the battalion chiefs and the lieutenants who were assigned to the battalion and notify the MDA aides and notify them to get them in to respond to the recall. So that was my first notification. The answering machine went off and I didn't even hear the message. It, I didn't hear the phone ringing because I had turned it off because I was gonna sleep in. And uh, I hear Tom whispering kind of, you know, John, I know you're on vac uh, vacation, but there's a total recall because of what happened at the World Trade Center. So get in here. And I'm like, what was that again? I had, to, you know, reach over and turn up the answering machine because he had already hung up and I replay it. And now I listen with the volume up and I said, recall, what happened at the World Trade Center? I had no idea. So I reach over and grab the TV remote and turn on the TV and, uh, you know, the talking heads are talking about airplanes and both towers are burning. And I'm like, holy crap, what happened there? You know, I mean, I had no idea. I had no idea it had been going on for over an hour at that point. And uh, as I'm starting to get dressed, I'm looking for a, a clean work uniform. And there's no, because I'm going on vacation, all my work uniforms are down in the laundry. And as I'm searching through the closet, the uh, South Tower collapsed right in front of me. And I'm like, Oh my God, I thought it was a bomb, you know, that just blew it up. But now I realize uh, that it was the tower collapsing after burning for almost an hour. So, yeah, it was a uh, very disturbing image, you know, to have in your mind. Again, fortunately for me at that point, I didn't know we had lost so many firefighters because I thought, well, this thing just happened. A bomb just went off and, uh, the fire department's probably still in route. And uh, instead, you know, they've been there on scene for an hour and uh, an hour, almost 15 minutes. And hundreds of firefighters were on scene already. 
and we lost, you know, 343 of them. So. so when you're, when you're coming into the, the city, um, you're a, you're a line battalion chief. Yeah. Tremendous history with, with SOC, with special operations command, but not currently assigned to it. And, um, you're going in and, and all these things are racing through your mind. Um, and you're probably, uh, if I remember, recall correctly reading the book, you're kind of fine. You know, you're trying to fight your way into the city and find your way into a, a, a station to where you can kind of mount, a uh, muster up a, a group of firefighters to kind of get in there. And that sounded like that was really unique, obviously, and challenging. Yeah. You know, the city had gone into total lockdown because we didn't know what else was going to happen. You know, we expected further attacks. We knew that in the past uh, there had been terrorist plots to attack all the bridges and tunnels because New York City is a city of islands. You know, all the boroughs are connected by bridges and tunnels. So that was a logical terrorist target. So the city, you know, deployed police officers to all of them and stopped everything from going across except emergency vehicles. So as I'm on my way in, I hear that. I've heard that on the TV reports as I was getting dressed. And now I, I have to go. My firehouse was in upper Manhattan. How am I going to get to upper Manhattan with all the bridges closed and tunnels closed? So I had my second set of turnout gear in the trunk. So I grabbed the helmet and, you know, started in I, I still hadn't gotten an fdny uniform the only thing i had was my fema go bag i had my you know three-day yeah. fema uniforms so i yeah. had it and actually i threw on a, a fema USAR task force uniform and uh, jumped in the car and drove in and as i was on the way in i had to get to a checkpoint uh, on the parkway the state troopers had the parkway shut down and i finally got there and just about the time i got there the north tower collapsed so now i realized that all right both towers are down there's no firefight left now it's going to be a collapse rescue operation and that's what i've spent you know at that point 16 years uh doing and teaching and said okay i need to get to the trade center site Go into the firehouse up in Harlem to be a battalion chief. Uh, now became a secondary consideration, and that I felt that I was needed at the World Trade Center site itself. Uh, so yeah, it was an adventure getting there. Uh, I got to a firehouse in Brooklyn before gridlock traffic absolutely stopped, and uh, reported into that firehouse and went with a group of those people to a staging area just on the man at uh, the brooklyn side of the manhattan bridge uh, and eventually we got called across the manhattan bridge so i assume my timeline i got down to the actual world trade center site about one o'clock in the afternoon because it took three hours to get there so by the time i got there both towers were down already what an excruciating three hours. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. Again, I was fortunate. Uh, you know, the timeline still hadn't sunk in yet that all these uh, firefighters would be on the scene. It wasn't uh, until I got to this first staging area and I met Mike Penna. And we're talking and I said, you know, what do you know? What's going on? And he says, well, you know, they started at quarter to nine, right? And I'm like, no, I didn't. He says, yeah, you know what that means? Because we change shifts at nine o'clock in the morning, nine at morning and six at night. So he says, you know, we're gonna lose a lot of people because if you were in the firehouse at quarter to nine, we had the possibility of two shifts on duty. And that's what happened. A lot of companies responded with both the on duty and the incoming platoon. So we lost guys that you know were not technically on duty. I believe the number ended up about 20 or 25 off-duty people who were not, uh, they rode with the, their company in spite of not being on duty. Right, like 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 any firefighter would do 
it's it's shift change. You're getting ready to come on duty, and uh, the off duty off going crew busts a fire. You're not even supposed to start for a half an hour, or an hour from now. But it's like, hey, I'm not going to miss a job. So, not this job, you know, not this job. I mean, and you know, there were people who said, well, they shouldn't have done it. Nonsense. If those buildings had not collapsed, we'd have needed every single one of them. That total recall, we'd have probably used, you know, three or four thousand firefighters. Uh, sure. Between, you know, the towers, if they again, if they didn't collapse, well, who's going to go up there and put them out? You know, the fires right. in the surrounding buildings. You know, so. Well, meanwhile, across the country in uh, California. You mentioned your USAR, your your uh, USAR FEMA go bag, and that made me realize, you know, that you you've got this intimate knowledge of of all these brothers that you work with, and you're going into your city, and uh, you're still trying to penetrate the labyrinth of security and and checkpoints and traffic. Meanwhile, I was in San Diego at an urban search and rescue task force meeting for the whole state. And uh, I was at my hotel getting ready to go to the meeting and I get this phone call to turn on the TV. And like you, the, I see the, the the tower collapse. I think it was the first one. And uh, and I just fell to my knees and went, oh, we're going. And this is the worst yeah. day in yep. firefight, American firefighting history, if not American history. And uh, problem was I was in San Diego and they had shut down the flights and my team's in right. Sacramento which is right. on a good day, <clears throat> that's going to be a, a seven to eight hour drive to uh, get back to Sacramento and then have to drive to um, the Air Force Base in Fairfield at Travis Air Force Base, get on the C-5 Galaxy, put the team on the Galaxy and go. And I was in charge of um, logistics. So it was my job and my team's job to get us to get the plane, yeah. get it loaded. We had, we had done a... Um, training with the airport squadron at Travis and done a, and sent a flight on a C5 with our team. No, no more than two months prior. So we were on a first name basis with everybody at the airport squadron. And, uh, so I'm racing up highway five in California cause I can't fly cause there's no air, there's no air traffic. And I made you, it, I made it. Go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, had you driven down there? No, I flew oh, down. You flew down. Now you got to rent the I, car. I, yeah. Well, yeah, well, fortunately, with logistics background, you know how we can lie, cheat, and steal to get whatever we want. So I, I commandeered a, a uh, vehicle, and one, me and one of the logistics folks from the Oakland task force um, rode, drove back together, and um, we made it from San Diego to, to the Air Force Base in five hours, which the, the normally would have taken eight. So I was, I think the average speed was about 120 miles an hour and only stopping for bathrooms and and, and Yes, but we got there and I actually beat the team to the Air Force Base, but they had my go bag. <laughs> we beat them by about 20 minutes. The team shows up by ground from Sacramento. Um, we get on the plane and we go. And, you know, like you, we're hearing updates and all kinds of crazy information as we're, as we're flying across the country. We had a couple of F-15s escorting us. We were one of the only blips on the radar. And um, so when, when I read your book, um, working with giants and I read the section on nine 11. Um, I was, I was mirroring your, your journey into the city and mine from across the country and yeah, well, yours, and all the you know, responders were doing the same thing. Every that's the point. Yeah. Emergency responder was doing the same thing, even if yeah. they never ended up getting deployed in their own right. city. I mean, America was under attack. Right. And nobody knew where the next attack was going to happen. The Pentagon had already happened now. And, yeah. you know, we were going into a full defensive posture. So every emergency responder in major cities was expecting the same thing to happen to their city next. Exactly. I remember it was a very eerie feeling driving north from San Diego through, through downtown Los Angeles to get to Sacramento. And there was no cars on the freeway. There was no cars on the streets. Everything was so quiet. Um, I was talking to FEMA. I was talking to our task force leadership. I was talking to my my logistics folks, and I was talking to the aerial port squadron at Travis. And 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 
you know, you must have been talking to 50 different people on the way in um, and everyone's doing this and, and working their way in. But were you able to even talk to anybody? Was everybody just in response no. mode? No, there was no cell phone service in much of the area. The lower Manhattan cell, cell network was shut down, which affected like the command post and uh, even fire department headquarters in Brooklyn. Cell phone service in that whole area was shut down. The uh, TV antenna for many of the broadcast networks was on the roof of the North Tower. So even the broadcast networks uh, went down when that collapse occurred. So we were operating in a almost a news blackout. Once yeah. you got to the World Trade Center site, we didn't know anything about what was going on. People at home had a much better picture of what was happening than we did on scene. Uh, visibility was so disrupted by the smoke and the dust. I mean, if particularly on the east and the south sides, you couldn't see 50 feet in front of you for days in many cases. Uh, it was just you couldn't get a picture of the overall scene. Uh, even we didn't get a helicopter view until several days later. Uh, and even that, you still couldn't capture what was going on because of the smoke and the dust around everything that obscured right. everything. So really, we were in a big, big deficit. I mean, every time I left to go someplace, I always tried to take a different route around the perimeter because I needed to see. It was such a broad, broad sight. And it took days to finally get a like full understanding of exactly what conditions were like. Right, right, and and then, you know, I'm, as you're talking, you think about the Nash Five. We talk about in our command classes in our book and stuff about uh, risk assessment, accountability, communications, uh, the command. It's a command factor, SOGs. I mean, all of those are are, are gone. I mean, you, you have no idea. Not only if there's more attacks underway in the city, but in the country, you have no idea. I remember the entire time we were there, we we're worried about all these buildings coming down on us. So we don't know if while we're attempting a rescue, whether it's an intentional secondary device or not, or the building's just going to fall on us. Oh, so, were, so the risk is out the window. Oh, the risk, you know, I, I tell them, think about this. When was the last time an American fire chief had to request fighter protection? You know, that's what Pete Gancy did that morning. You know, I need fighter, fighter protection overhead here. You know, there were rumors of additional airplanes. The third, uh, well, the fourth plane that ended up in Shanksville. Now our Office of Emergency Management had gotten briefed on another missing plane. There were reports of many more missing planes. So that threat was out there. Uh, Several days later, there was a report that one of our rescue trucks was missing. And the concept was that, you know, terrorists had stolen it, taken it someplace, packed it with explosives, and now would drive it back in, having unfettered access right to the heart of the command post, and, uh, you know, destroy all these emergency responders, including the out-of-town folks now. They would have been able to wipe out the experts from across the country. Uh, so, you know, there was a tremendous ongoing threat. You know, later on, there was the anthrax attack in October. Uh, we had, I think it was six real anthrax attacks in New York City. Uh, you know, it wasn't the suspicious powders. We did tens of thousands of the suspicious powder sure. runs, but six of them were real weapons-grade anthrax. Uh, sent to the news media outlets and through one of the post offices. So, yeah, the, the threat matrix was extremely high and yeah. tough to say, well, you know, we're going to take all the precautions necessary because you don't know what precautions to take. Exactly. It, it was just a, it was a, it was, it was the ultimate chaos it was with a country nationwide chaos, not just, I mean, the epicenter, of ground zero and then from there just chaos throughout the country and so 
from a risk assessment standpoint, you're off the charge. From an accountability standpoint, you don't know where anybody is, who's coming, who's going, who's trapped, who's missing, who got out, who was on scene. That's got that had to have been. It took us weeks to finally get a definite accounting of everybody that was missing. You know, the scene was so big and chaotic. You know, you'd ask, you know, have you seen so and so? Oh yeah, I saw him around the corner. Well, we found their body, you know, weeks later. Or you'd say, oh, you know, where's Joe? And oh, Joe's dead. Joe's definitely dead. Well, no, Joe was fine. You know, so uh, I remember, I think it was Thursday morning or Friday. No, it had to be Thursday, you know, going to rescue one. And uh, they had the list on the board of, you know, who was missing. Well, you know, no matter how prepared you think you are for that, seeing it in writing is, uh, you know, devastating. But then we weren't sure about that. You know, the SOC command was calling hourly for updates. Have you heard from this guy? Have you heard from that guy? You know, are you sure that they weren't on vacation or, you know, wherever? So, yeah, it took a, a long, long time before we actually had accountability for who was there, who wasn't there. Yeah, yeah. And then as we're coming in, as we're coming in, we're getting more and more updates of of the magnitude of of. And, and honestly, it didn't dawn on us until I, I want to say we we're in route airborne. Uh, probably halfway across the country, where it really started to dawn on us how many firefighters were going to be the, trapped on top of the citizens, citizens. And and it was like, Oh my God, now we're starting to think, then it got personal. Then it got real personal. We're starting to think of, okay, who's in there? Who do we know? Who would have been responding? Who would have been on duty that day? Um, but it still didn't, it, it, the magnitude never, like you said, we didn't have TV. We didn't have a lot of, of, of images until we got on scene and got there at the pile. And, and we're just, uh, dumbfounded by the devastation, by the by how flatly smashed th- these apparatus were, and, and and cars are piled on each other, and headlights are still on, and windshield wipers are still on, and and things, a lot of fires is, were still going, and and just it was a war scene, and absolutely, yeah. it was a war scene. It was it was an act of war, so it was a war scene, and and um, the, you mentioned communications earlier. And we go going back to Nash Five, even whether it's a house fire, room of contents, or nine eleven. These are all five factors that 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 are critical to success of an incident. So communications, like you mentioned, there were no communications. Communications, you know, particularly in the towers, you know, they cost firefighters' lives. Uh, the we knew our handy talkie system at the time was a point to point. Uh, excuse me, it was a local uh, system. Uh, we did not have a handy talkie that could talk to the dispatcher or to hear the dispatcher's uh, conversation inside the buildings. Uh, the police department used a different communications network. So our network in high rise buildings depended on the building repeater system taking our message and repeating it, broadcasting it up through the building. When it collapses, or not even the collapses, when the plane impacted the two towers, uh, at least in one building, that system was lost entirely. Now, it took time for the guys to walk because the elevators were out, so it took time to get up and realize you're out of communications network. Uh, in some cases, because the staircases were built in the core of the structure, uh, if you got out to the perimeter of the structure, you could sometimes reach the ground, or reach the command post. But it took time to realize that, that the yeah. system is not functioning the way it was supposed to. Now, when they gave the order to evacuate, uh, people on the upper floors did not get that message. My brother David, who was a New York City Police Emergency Services officer, was up on the 31st floor uh, operating actually with Rescue One. 
uh, treating down firefighters when the South Tower collapsed, everybody knew right away something bad had happened. They thought it was an earthquake or something because the building shook so badly, but nobody knew what. The cops, immediately, their radio system was able to tell them, the building just fell down, all units get out. And very clear, you know, this is bad, get out. Uh, the fire department units there did not get that message. Uh, even when command in the street at that point was ordering evacuation, all units in the North Tower were evacuated. A lot of units just didn't get it. So communications was absolutely uh, crucial. Like you say, it's always crucial, but in that situation, it probably cost people's lives. Oh, I, I, no, no doubt it costs hundreds, if not thousands of lives in some, on some respects, I would imagine. I mean, uh, you know, and then finally, the incident command component of, you know, I remember what what was challenging for us was penetrating the labyrinth of, of layers, whether it was security across the bridge, whether it was was um, finding an appropriate counterpart from FEMA or from FDNY. Um, obviously, if everybody at FDNY, is, nobody at FDNY had ever encountered an incident of this magnitude. The largest, most sophisticated, busiest fire department in the world had never encountered something of this magnitude. Nobody had. And you got to realize our leadership was decapitated. The, exactly. chief, of the, part, the chief of departments dead. Uh, Donald Burns and uh, Jerry Barber, two assistant chiefs. Donald Burns was the like senior assistant chief in the department. He had been chief of operations. He was part of the institutional knowledge. Uh, gone. Ray Downey, who was you know, instrumental in creating the FEMA task forces. Uh, gone. He would have been obviously the guy. And now he hasn't been seen. You know, he was last seen just prior to the uh, South Tower, uh, the North Tower collapsing. So, uh, you know, we were falling back uh, a lot of the survivors and, you know, the assistant chiefs who had come in from home uh, narrowly escaped death themselves. Uh, Chief of Operations, Danny Nigro, uh, he was doing a lap around the building to get a report back to Chief Gancy when the tower collapsed and very narrowly escaped himself. So a lot of these, now they suck in, you know, pounds of concrete dust and glass and, you know, asbestos fibers and all the toxins that were present. So they were in no condition to really, you know, jump right back in there and start doing things. Fortunately, several of the assistant chiefs were out. They weren't quite at the command post yet. They, they were coming in from home and, uh, you know, they were able to step in. But you know, our command structure was absolutely decimated. So now it's time to start rebuilding. And it didn't happen right away. Uh, no, the reorganizational not. meeting at headquarters took place, I think it was at headquarters, uh, I believe it was Friday morning. And, you know, that, that's four days later, well, three days later. Uh, because now we're getting a sense of who's missing. So now we have to start plugging in people to fill those voids. And that, that's how I ended up in my role. Uh, Chief Downey was still missing. Nobody was, well, we knew Chief Gancy was dead. We recovered his body that afternoon. Uh, a few other people, we had recovered bodies, but most of them were just in the debris pile and wouldn't be found for months, if ever. So they were treated as missing. So, okay, temporary appointments. You, you were going to be, and actually I didn't get the message uh, right away. Chief Carruthers, who was the fire department, became the fire department's incident commander long-term, uh, came to me and said, uh, you've got Ray Downey's job. And I didn't, know exactly what he meant. I thought he was talking about, okay, here, you're going to be, I came to search and rescue manager. And, uh, okay, that would have been Ray's job. 
Ray would have been the search and rescue manager had he survived. And he said that. And I was like, I guess Ray's not, you know, hasn't been found. You know, there were people in hospitals over in New Jersey. So people were transported all throughout the region by private cars, by ferries, you know, people went everywhere. So we we're trying to uh, trace unconscious people in hospitals, hoping that we'd find them. So when it became clear that, okay, nobody has seen Ray, we've traced all the hospitals and uh, okay, now start plugging in the voids and okay, you've got Ray's job. So. I can't imagine what that must have felt like to to have that weight put on you from a from a line battalion chief coming in off duty to the this in, immense devastation, starting to learn about friends um, and the impact, the magnitude of this, and then having that. Uh, did the adrenaline just was the adrenaline just flowing so much that you had you just kind of said, okay, um, you know, going to just push on and take care of business, or was it more of a? Nah, the adrenaline I think was worn off by the second day. You just, yeah. you know, you can't do it that long. It doesn't right. sustain that long. You've been operating, yeah. you know, almost 48 hours and you can't run on adrenaline. Yeah. Uh, you know, you just mentioned it, the other factor. I mean, Ray Downey, uh, besides being this legendary figure, was also another close friend. Uh, yep. he, he took me in as his lieutenant, gave me an opportunity to work for him. But then we taught, I mean, Ray was the guy that, you know, got me uh, on the FEMA USAW staff, the instructional staff. When we did that first uh, uh, rescue specialist class out in, uh, oh man, down in Virginia, Fairfax, Virginia, I believe it was, uh, you know, Ray was the guy that recommended me for that position. And we taught we taught at FEMA, and we also taught firefighting classes around the country ourselves, he and I. Uh, so he was, a again, another friend like Dennis that, man, I, I couldn't conceive of losing him. And he was such a mentor. He's the guy that uh, put me in as the captain of Rescue Company 1 when there was an opening. Right, right. Uh, you know, so to think about losing Ray, I mean, it was another devastating impact that uh, – so now I've got to step in there, and you know, when I went, when I went to special operations, weeks later, uh, I pulled into Ray's parking spot because there was no place else. There was a, a cone blocking it, you know, reserved for chief of special operations, and I pulled in and I moved the cone out of the way, and one of the firefighters comes out and says, "Oh, you can't park there. That's reserved for Chief Downey." And I had to say, you know, okay, get everybody together, bring them all into the apparatus floor. And I started out the thing with, listen, I'm here temporarily. I'm the new chief of special operations. I am not Ray Downey. I can't be Ray Downey, but I got to do the best that I can in memory of Ray Downey. So it's got to be good enough because it's going to be the best I can do. And if it's not good enough, let me know. So that's all I could Amen. do, you know. Amen. Unimaginable, unimaginable. Yeah, yeah. Anthony. Unimagin unimaginable. I, I, I'm trying. Yeah, I, I just want to. We're not. You know, we're, we're going to talk a little bit more, but I don't want to go too long because I'm. I know I'm. I'm dredging up a ton of memories, and it's emotional for you. Um, but I do want to just take time to thank you, even before we're done, for for sharing all this because I know it's it's not easy. I know it's hard. Um. But I thank you for agreeing to do this because of the opportunity to honor your friends, to share these important inside stories of what, what you went through and, and your connection with these, with these legends and dear friends of yours. Well, that's the, the most important part is, like you said, never forget means never forgetting. And more important, documenting it, capturing this stuff, sharing it with future generations because there are kids – you know, I mean, firefighters today who were not even alive on September 11th, who have no concept of what happened, no concept of who these people were and how valuable they were to the fire service and to the world. So capturing this and sharing it with all those people for the future is important. It's critical. And I, 
I think there's a, another element, especially in our country right now, of division. I'm not going to get political or anything, but one of the things I noticed when we came back, you mentioned being in a cocoon or kind of in this little bubble, and then the rest of the world knew more than we did when we were in the in the pile. And coming home uh, 11 days later, I remember we got home to the tra- uh, Air Force Base in Travis again, uh, probably midnight. And we drove back to Sacramento, which is about an hour drive. And every overpass at midnight, one o'clock in the morning, had American flags, had had crossed aerials, had we had a CHP Harriet Patrol escorts the whole way. And we're, we were just going, what is this? What is all this? You know, what is all this? We didn't know the outside of those few square blocks that the rest of the country had another process that they were going through of healing, unity, looking to the future. Um, and that sense of unity that I know everybody felt uh, in the in the weeks and months that followed 9-11 is something that I that I miss. And I, and I sometimes feel like we're doing a disservice to those who died that day by not maintaining the level of unity we did as a nation in the wake of that terrible tragedy. We say, never forget. Well, how about we never forget what came out of it that was good, which was patriotism, unity, um, cherishing each other more, letting each other in, in traffic, letting somebody take the lane in front of you instead of flipping them off. Just little things that 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 took us back to a time when everybody was unified in patriotism and, and sense of unity towards what was good in America. And like we always say, it takes a common enemy sometimes to make adversaries come together, right? We were, we, were, we were slapped in the face, punched in the gut by a common enemy. And for a while, politics didn't matter. It didn't matter. It, yeah. We were all Americans. Absolutely. And we're still all Americans, but we have to remember that part, you know? Right. Yeah. We're here. We should be here for each other and for America. Exactly. Exactly. So um, when you wrote your book... Um, did you find that process cathartic? And when I talk about your book, was it had you already processed everything on some other level, or was the book the first time you'd really processed your thoughts on nine eleven? Uh, well, the the book had actually most of it had been written years earlier. Uh, I, I said in the book, and I would go through these events and guys would say man that was amazing somebody should make a movie about that you know somebody should write that down so i did i started taking notes i actually kept i still have them i I kept the response tickets for some of the events that you know really really stood out and i wrote the story down usually within a few days of it happening and kept all that. Uh, The first and the last two chapters were not written. They weren't written until uh, after I retired. Uh, And actually, they weren't the last chapter in particular, the World Trade Center chapter. I didn't write that until I really said, okay, Uh, I had a, a fall up in the Adirondack Mountains in January of 2019. And it was very life or death. I mean, I certainly could have ended up dead up in that mountain, except for my wife was with me. Uh, She was spectacular. She went and got help. Uh, The Edinburgh Fire Department up in the Adirondacks, the Edinburgh EMS squad and the Northville Fire Department performed a wilderness rescue that was spectacular. And uh, I start, you know, I was laying there by myself out in the woods on ice for about an hour and a half to maybe two hours. And if I recall from your book, you you were you couldn't move. You couldn't move while you were from, paralyzed yeah. from the neck down. Right. I could not move my fingers, my legs. I couldn't move anything. So you're laying there for that time frame, uh, contemplating the rest of your life. You know, man. I don't want to be a quadriplegic from, you know, from here down for the rest of my life. And 
uh, if I am or if I die, which is a real possibility too. I mean, there there's plenty of wildlife out there that could have eaten, eaten me alive while I was laying there helpless. And uh, you're thinking to yourself, man, so many things I wanted to do. You know, so many things that uh, I'm not going to get to do now. And one of them was telling the stories of all those people, you know, that I was privileged enough to work with. And the September 11th chapter in particular that, you know, I had a very unique uh, part of it. And I said, I, I, I got to somehow get this down. I got to get it down and get it out because if I'm not here, you know, I, again, I believe that. You have to share these stories with future generations. It's history. It's American history. It's an important part of our history. And if I don't get this down and out, well, that'll be a loss. So that's what really prompted me to do something with it and sit down and write those uh, chapters that... Uh, particularly the ones that centered around September 11th, and then certainly the aftermath. Well, for those of you who, who don't know, um, who haven't heard about the chief's accident till now, um, you know, you talk about that in your book in a lot of detail and it's, it's graphic and, and um, it, it just encapsulates what an amazing life you've led to this point. A, a living legend and um to to after all you've been through after all the fires we read about in your book working with giants all the narrow escapes all these crazy fires apartment fires tenement fires commercial fires crawling around in in you know <laughs> bowstring trust spaces and just all this craziness and then 9 11 and then to fall on the ice in a mountain somewhere that that wasn't going to be the end no way no way and but <sighs> I'm glad. I'm glad I'm it glad. wasn't. I'm, I'm really glad it was. I'm really glad it wasn't. And and after talking to you um, afterwards at FDIC, um, I think it might have been 21, um, 20 or twenty one. Um, you know, you were still very fragile health wise and and very guarded. You know, I went to give you a hug. And you said no, no, not this time. Uh, yeah, because yeah, <laughs> I, I give big hugs and you know I have Tourette. So if I hug you and twitch, I might I might throw your back out. So uh, we don't want that. Um, but, 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 you know, to put yourself out there with this book, um, you know, having responded and, and lost friends that day to hear your stories and to hear that you had to fight your way in too, you weren't on duty. You weren't, you weren't, you know, you had to fight your way in. And I thought, wow, even chief Norman had to fight his way into the city to help. And that's what we had to do. We had to fight our way in because of the, again, the bureaucracy, the system, the, the, the FEMA system hadn't ever had a response like that. New York had never asked for help like that. You know, the F, when, when did FDNY ever ask for mutual aid? <laughs> you know, it doesn't happen. Rarely. But yeah. <laughs> so whereas in California, that's it's a it, in California, it happens every summer with our wildfires. You know, we have large scale incidents that last a month. We lose hundreds and hundreds of homes and we're mutual aid is as common as going on a medical aid call. It's just we're used to it um so there was a lot of a lot of uh um out of the box steep learning curves for all of us and for you to share with us your you know your operational experience and the facts but to share your personal story your emotions the relationships um um is going to honor uh your brothers and our friends for decades to come. It, it is telling American history. Um, so anyone who's listening to this, if you haven't already, please get Working with Giants by John Norman because it is a masterpiece. I, I, I've got, I tell people, I, I, I'm easy. It's easier for me to write a book than read a book. <laughs> I can't, I, I have a short attention span. I have a lot of books that I start and, and, and very few that I finish. There's books laying all over my house that I've started in the bathroom, by my bed stand, in my office, you know, and I don't finish a lot of books because um, I just, my attention span is, is like a hummingbird on crack, you know, squirrel. And I'm, you know, so, but your book, I could not put it down. 
I couldn't put it down. And I wanted to skip ahead to 9-11 because I'm like, okay, what is he? I want to, I want to connect with, with Chief Norman on that. But I, I said, nope, it's, that's, nope, I want it. So I went through these pages and pages and pages, stories, unbelievable fires and battles and friendships and ups and downs and losses and lefts and rights that you had. Um, and then culminating in 9-11. Um, and so um, let's talk, as we close out here, um, I, wanted, I just want to talk about, like you said, what was the rebuilding process? Because y- you said so many things about, you know, you compare the Nash 5 on a house fire, listen to it, talk Nash 5 on 9-11. The entire, the entire head of the FDNY was, was decapitated. Communications were taken out. There was zero accountability. There was, there was no, there was, it was the ultimate chaos on an, on an international scale. Um, but and everyone there had to not only contend with that scene and the operational aspects of it, but the emotional aspects of it, having lost friends, um, having lost mentors, heroes, people that were, like you said, with, with, uh, chief Downey, I, I, I only got to meet chief Downey a couple times and he made an impact on me. I can't imagine having him as a dear friend, mentor, teach someone you teach with, um, how did you rebuild? What was it like after you parked in that parking space and said, "Hey, let's all let's all meet up"? What was it like those those that year after that? Well, everybody, because of the nature of the event, the suddenness of it, you know, everybody in the FDNY was like you said, so unified and shocked at the same time, but they were determined. They were determined to get through this, determined to make things better, determined to honor their friends. And it was just the sense of, okay, we got to do this. Let's go. And that was universal. I mean, one of the stories that I tell is about Dennis Murphy. Uh, Dennis Murphy was a captain in squad 288. Uh, seriously injured just three months before the 9-11 attacks. He was uh, badly broken up in the explosion at the hardware store on Father's Day. Uh, Still on crutches on September 11th. And I was working to find a location for the permanent FDNY command post and originally We were going to use the quarters of engine 10 and ladder 10 as the command post. And I was in there setting it up, getting, you know, logistics laid out, getting phone lines put in, uh, getting radios set up, getting desks in place. And uh, this is right, right across the street from the World Trade Center. The building was impacted by debris from the World Trade Center. The street out front is covered in steel and i see dennis murphy come hobbling in dennis was a good friend of mine also uh he is on crutches trying to navigate the steel that's blocking the street you know through the smoke and everything and he comes in and he says john i'm here to do whatever i can do for you what do you need He's, you know, I'll sit there. You know, I'll sit there and answer phones, do whatever you need. That kind of dedication was just universal. There's a hundred percent, one hundred percent response to the recall. Every every firefighter who could get out of bed, who was not in a hospital bed, responded and did whatever was asked of them. And that kind of attitude, you know, was like I said, it was universal, and not just in the FDNY. It was, you know, every emergency service responded. Everybody in the city of New York who really had a bone of humanity left in them uh, felt the same way. You know, they were just uh, okay. 
we've been kicked hard, but we're going to get up. And, you know, I, I tell people all the time, we didn't do it by ourselves. You know, the USAR task forces, I think 11 USAR task forces deployed to the Trade Center site over various time periods. Uh, apparatus manufacturers, you know, we had all five of the rescue, no, well, yeah, all five of the rescue apparatus were destroyed. Uh, so many apparatus destroyed, engines, you know, everything we needed to rebuild. And, uh, you know, the apparatus manufacturing capacity in the country could not meet the FDNY's requirements in a year. They just couldn't do it. On top of that, you had every other fire department in the country still needs apparatus as well. Uh, they put the FDNY at the head of their list. They told many other fire departments, listen, you're going to have to wait. Uh, we'll get your, you know, they've got orders in already. We'll get to you, but this is an emergency situation. And every fire department just said, yeah, okay, we understand. Uh, so the whole nation understood the impact and responded accordingly the way we would hope to see. You know, uh, we talked about accountability. You know, that created problems in and of itself because we had all these unsolicited volunteers who came to the site and now want to help uh, to do anything they possibly can. But they were outside the command structure. Uh, we didn't know who they were, where they are. We had no way to communicate with them. There were dangers all over the place that they did not get briefed on. And now, you know, at times we would issue an emergency evacuation because something was going, you know, we just discovered something bad. We had a way to communicate with those folks. So that created its own issues. But uh, universally, everybody felt the same way. Okay. We're we're gonna fix this. We're gonna get through this. We're gonna get better. And you just put one foot in front of the other, and took another step, and kept going. Yeah. Amen. You know, it's it's funny as I I go around the country teaching a common a common uh, challenge for fire departments over the past several years has been obviously COVID and staffing. Um, and you know, it's the opposite of what you described. You know, um, there's not a hundred percent, you know, callback rate. There's not a lot of, a lot of people are, are not, we've seen it in California during wildfire season. We've seen it all over the place. And I hope anybody listening to this is inspired, um, by your story chief. And I'm going to let you go. Cause I know your back's probably hurting. You've been sitting a long time. Um, but I want to thank you for this, for this time. It's precious. I want to thank you for sharing your, not only your experience, but your heart with us, um, we're going to make sure it gets out to as many people as possible to honor uh, our brothers. Um, and it's, and as you mentioned, it's, it's the, all that, that concrete dust and all that bad stuff that everybody inhaled um, our team. Still inhaled. taking a toll. We have a lot of members of our team who are sick. Um, I'm going to do a, if you don't mind, a quick shout out to a dear friend, Randy Gross, who is right now fighting for his life uh, because of cancer. And he was a dog handler on our team for nine 11. And, uh, it's no doubt related, 100% related yeah. to, to 9-11. It's and, still uh, taking a toll. It is. So Never Forget has a lot of faces to it. There's a lot of ways to never forget. So I hope everyone listening to this, Never Forget could just be having a good attitude. It could be showing up to work on a day that you weren't supposed to work because somebody else called in sick. Um, it could be um, a lot of things. So it's more than a tattoo. It's more than a sticker on your truck. Those are good things, but it's action. That's attitude. Um, and what you said about the hundred percent recall rate and, and guys hobbling in on crutches to make it work unified and determined. I, I circled that. You said unified and determined and that's everything. Absolutely. And, and, and one last thing, chief, I want to thank you for the gift of, of writing the forward to our new book coming out at FDIC 2024. That was an immense gift. I'm uh, looking forward to you. it. Thank you, chief. So God bless you, okay. uh, the NFDNY, and and everybody who's uh, in the fire service. Thank you again. Thank you, sir. Thanks for making it possible and remembering. Yeah.